Okay, so it is pleasure to have Hubert Ragnar today, and he will tell us about topology of surprisal. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and uh, for you know for the for the opportunity to to give a talk uh, to to a potentially larger audience than than usually. And I mean, I, I guess the title for now uh, will have to remain. Uh, a mystery, but I, I will I will explain what I mean by this. Uh, so this the setup, the setting for this talk is that I would like to uh, work with data, which is represented as as probability vectors, uh, or in other words, discrete probability distributions uh, describing the same random variable. Uh, so I mean, in practice, this could be some kind of histograms um, or maybe predictions of uh, let's say uh, a classifier which which give you probability distributions. Um, geometrically, we can think about points on the standard simplex, uh, like in the picture. Uh, and then one question: if if we're in the setting, one question is how do we how do we compute distances uh, between our data points? And one answer is that well. Technically, those are points in Rn. We can just use the usual Euclidean distance. And if we're interested in applying tools like the Vietoris Rips uh, filtration and playing with things like persistence, then I mean we, we will get uh, results from this. Uh, and the, the point of this talk is that is to is to show that there are alternatives to doing this uh, and and that they're actually quite intuitive. So I will in this talk I will focus on intuitions uh, behind those kind of alternative. Uh, distances that we can use, uh, and I, I guess if you're if you're a statistician, then I mean it's it's probably obvious that uh, that that there, there are options, uh, but but somehow because this in in TDA this setup is kind of so geometric uh, at the beginning, I mean it's it's kind of natural to 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 forget that we have those tools which come from uh, from information theory and and statistics. Uh, so the plan for today is that. I would like to start from by introducing uh, the Kullback library divergence, uh, which will be our main way of of comparing uh, those probability vectors. Then I would like to go a little bit into information theory and and in particular coding theory uh, to convey some of the intuition behind this. And then we will tune the usual Vitoris Rips construction so that we can actually use uh, this Kullback library divergence. Uh, with it. Um, in the manual, you'll see there are some uh, apparent problems with, with using this, for example, is not symmetric, but those problems will go away quite nicely. Uh, I should mention that uh, some of you may have may have seen this in a slightly from a slightly dis different perspective. So those the results I'm going to mention uh, come from uh, from our collaboration with uh, Herbert Edelsbrunner and Giga, who I think is actually here, uh, Giga Virk. And we have this much more general setup uh, for Bregman divergences, and the Kullback library divergence is just one element of, of this family. Uh, I decided to, to focus on the Kullback library divergence because it's probably the most uh, applicable one. Also, in our work, we, we focus on check complexes, um, but uh, so, so what I'm mentioning here is more tailored towards uh, Vietoris Rips complexes, which are kind of at this point uh, more more practical because of computational reasons. And finally, I don't really want to talk about applications in in any depth. Uh, I do mention some some quite concrete applications in my other uh, talk uh, for the for the AA the Iran network. So. Uh, so, so it's available. You can you can have a look at this. I really want to focus on intuitions here. Okay, so uh, before we we start talking about about those topics, let's let's talk about something uh, kind of intuitive. So I I am proposing a, a completely unfair game to you, uh, with which I totally rigged, uh, but you don't know this. Uh, so let's say we each of us rolls um, a number of six sided uh, dice repeatedly. Uh, and well, I I I give you I, I give you a set of dice, and I also have my set. Uh, and 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 the way it works is that we we never reveal the the results to each other. We just completely trust each other. So let's say we we roll the dice, and then we just count 
we, we sum up the numbers that show up uh, and then we announce it to, to each other. Since we trust each other, nothing could go wrong with this. Uh, and and I, I won the game. It doesn't really matter how the how the game works. I, I won. And and obviously, you know, you, you suspect that maybe I cheated uh, after all. So this is the this is the setup. Uh, so I will try to convince you that I didn't cheat. And I will tell you that during the game, I actually computed the, the frequencies of each numbers. And now I'm computing. Uh, so, so I have two vectors. Uh, I, have, I have P, which is, I mean, what you would uh, presume to be the, the expected probabilities uh, for each number, uh, which, you know, it, it would just be one six for each number. Uh, we, we encode it as a vector. And then Q is, is the actual observation that I, uh, that I got. So those would be the frequencies of the, of the numbers that I, that I got. And I'm, I'm telling you that everything is okay because if you compute the, the Euclidean distance between those two vectors or the mean squared error, then th this is very small. So everything is okay. So if you if 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 you're satisfied, this is good because I, I just won a lot of money. Uh, if you still push the issue, then uh, if you actually force force me to to show you the actual uh, the actual frequencies, then I'm forced to reveal that p seven, which is the frequency of the number seven showing up on a six sided die, you know, with numbers from one to six. Uh, so so seven occurred, uh, you know, very rarely, uh, but it still uh, occurred. And if I would still like to defend myself, I, I could say that this is, uh, well, I mean, this, this, this frequency is, is tiny. So, I mean, everything was fair be just because this, this is so tiny. Uh, so it almost never happened. So, I mean, the, the game is not rigged at all. Um, I mean, so, so if you're a reasonable person, obviously you will, uh, you, you will notice that something is very wrong with, my, with the dice I used. Uh, but my point here is that uh, it's not something which you can detect with the with the Euclidean distance. Uh, instead, if we compute something which which I, I just kind of introduce as a, as a kind of black box, I just give you a formula for now. If you use something which is called the Kullback Leibler divergence, uh, which is described by this formula, uh, then then we can let, let's just observe what happens. So in particular, the the KL takes uh, two probability vectors as inputs. And in particular, we have the, the vector Q is what we, is our expectations. And in these expectations, uh, the, the frequency of the, the probability of sevens is zero, uh, just because they, I mean, they, they don't exist on six-sided die. And, but in reality, we have this P7, which is some epsilon, which is strictly greater than zero. Uh, so in reality, what happened is that we, we got a few sevens. And if we compute the Euclidean distance between the two, then we get something, you know, which is roughly equal to, to epsilon. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you interpret this result on, on face value, I mean, it says like, well, fair enough. I mean, no, nothing is wrong with those, uh, with those probability distributions. But if you compute the KL divergions, then you will actually get infinity, uh, which is easy to see because in the formula, uh, we would divide, uh, you know, p7 by q7, which gives us division by zero, which we can interpret as as infinity. So, so this is, a, you know, this is this is this divergence telling us that this is like completely impossible, uh, which is something which we, which is a reasonable reaction in in this uh, situation. If we were actually playing this game, uh, and if I had to reveal that, you know, my presumably fair dice. Uh, from time to time, conveniently give me a seven. Like this is this is very sketchy, and I, I guess uh, you know uh, most people would have a strong reaction uh, to this. And and the KL divergence actually conveys this. It has this very strong reaction, which pretty much says that this is impossible. Unlike let's say the Euclidean distance. Uh, so the so this is just an intuitive example. Uh, but my point here is that uh, we can try to really understand this Kullback liable divergence. Uh, so that this becomes more intuitive, uh, and then we will see how we can use it in uh, with you know using TDA methods in particular with the uh, Vietoris Rips filtrations, uh, presumably to get persistence diagrams. Uh, so let's see. 
so so to understand what's really happening we need a small uh, detour into into basic information theory so we'll actually see how how this works oh and by the way if if there are any questions if i if i skip something important uh feel free feel free to 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 interrupt me Uh, so one one thing we have to talk about is uh, is coding. So let's say we have those two probability vectors, and again, I mean, let, let's say for simplicity, let's say that they correspond to events of which are results of uh, of rolling a four sided die, and one of them is fair, and the other is is clearly uh, is is clearly not. Uh, so for for the fair one, uh, if we want to uh, encode each of those events as as a string of bits, uh, then well we we th there's really not much choice if we if we want to do this efficiently. Uh, each event, each number gets uh, gets two bits, and this will enable the person who so so we can encode it like this, and it's also clear how to how to decode it the message composed of bits into into numbers so in this case we obviously need uh two bits uh on average to to encode uh this type of messages now for the uh for the biased die uh now we have events which are more probable and and some of them are less probable uh so the trick here is that we can we can exploit this and in particular we can uh, we can encode the more probable events uh, with shorter codes and less probable ones uh, with longer ones. So in particular, one here uh, has probability one half. Uh, so it really makes sense to, to assign it as short code as possible. So in this case, one, uh, one gets, uh, gets a zero. Uh, and two is encoded as one zero. 3s110 and 4s111. Uh, we have to be a little bit careful so that we can actually decode uh, those messages, those strings of bits back, but in this case we, we can. Uh, and we can compute how much, how many bits uh, we need on average uh, to pay for, for encoding uh, messages like, like these. And I mean this is this is just a very easy computation. I mean we 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 just compute the expectations. So those are the probabilities. These are the number of bits. And on average, we get 1.75 bits. Uh, so, so this is what we have to pay on average to encode uh, you know, messages coming from this distribution, uh, which, is, which is obviously lower than what we had to do uh, with, uh, with the fair die. So, so I, I understand this is a little bit of a strange uh, detour. And uh, if we actually had to encode, you know, things as as bits explicitly like this, I mean, I, I don't think it would be like th this would be feasible to to talk about those, you know, to 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 to, to use this callback library diversions. Uh, the good news is that we we can. I mean, this is the setup, but we completely can forget about any, you know, explicit encodings. And this is thanks to Shannon's entropy, uh, which gives us. Uh, let's say a good lower bound on the number of bits we we need, and it is just a very simple formula. Uh, if you look at this, this is it's just an expectation over something which is often called the information content, which is this log binary logarithm of of the inverse of the probability of, of each event. So this is a very simple formula, uh, which which you know allows us to circumvent all this coding business. It literally just gives us uh, the the average number of bits we need to encode messages coming from a given distribution. Uh, so so this is nice. And if we if we you know computed uh, this, uh, if we computed if we applied this formula to our two distributions, we would actually get uh, we would actually get uh, the numbers two and one seven five, which means that uh, the encodings we we got uh, were actually in this case optimal. 
and this has to do with the fact that the, all the probabilities are actually inverses of, of powers of two. Um, so this is very useful. And with this, we can we can start understanding what our coolback Lyell-Bird divergence actually does. Uh, by the way, it's often also called uh, the relative entropy. So we we use this kind of ugly but compact formula uh, before, uh, but this can be rewritten as as the difference of two terms. And the term on the left uh, is often called the cross entropy, uh, and on the one on the right is the Shannon's entropy, which we which we have already seen. Uh, so cross entropy uh, mixes up the the two probability vectors, uh, and in particular, it takes the expectation over the information content, but of the of the second vector of of the vector q, and this can be interpreted as the number of bits uh, we need to encode events coming from p when we're expecting events coming from q. Uh, this is the, the average number of bits. And Shannon's entropy, we already know that it gives us the average number of bits to encode p, assuming we have full information. So we know p and we want to encode events coming from p. Uh, so KL is actually this difference. So one way of uh, interpreting this is that uh, KL gives us the number of extra bits uh, which we pay for for our ignorance about about reality about p, uh, when in fact you know we we believe that q would happen. So we we optimize our code uh, we, if we were doing this explicitly uh, with you know uh, as we did with those two examples, we would we would uh, have an explicit code for each event based on the probabilities on Q, uh, but then in reality, P can be significantly different, so our code is, in, is not optimal, and then we pay for this uh, with our coding efficiency. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that KL expresses the surprisal, which happens when one would expect events coming from Q, uh, but gets uh, events coming from P. So, so to some extent, this hopefully uh, starts explaining the, the title of the talk uh, because the surprisal is something we'll, we'll use inside our topological constructions, in, in particular inside uh, the Vietoris ribs filtration. And if we, if, we, uh, if we get back to our unfair game, then we can we can also get a slightly better explanation of of what happened then where we when we when we applied the curl divergence to to those vectors. So as a reminder, we in particular we had these expectations that that sevens uh, cannot happen, and in reality, uh, some sevens did occur. Uh, so this is encoded by by this p seven, and in the language of of you know information theory coding theory. Uh, it just means that if we're not expecting a symbol, then uh, there no code would be created for it. So, and then if we if we try to to compute how what, what is our surprisal or how many bits on average we'll have to pay for not being prepared for this, then this is infinity uh, because like there is no uh, there is no message of of finite length we, which would allow us to encode uh, which would allow us to encode the information about sevens because we were completely unaware that something like a seven exists. So we, we were completely unprepared. In particular, we, we did not uh, have any code for this because we just didn't know about the existence of sevens. Uh, so, so this explains you know, this, this infinity here. Uh, this is actually quite intuitive and it actually conveys uh, something important. Uh, this also shows that it's easy to see that if we swap the roles of P and Q, if we were actually, if we were prepared to see sevens, but they would not happen in practice. Uh, in other words, if we computed KL in the opposite direction, uh, then this value would be smaller than infinity. This would be finite because we would have a code for a seven, we would just not use it. So it would, you know, it would affect our coding uh, potentially, um, but the value itself would not be infinite. Uh, which which uh, actually is, is one example 
which is probably the simplest example showing the lack of symmetry in in KL. So KL is not going to be symmetric in, in general. Um, so this is this is more of a side remark, but now that we know what KL and also what cross entropy is, um, I, I just wanted to mention that this is uh, this is often used as a as a loss to be minimized in in various um, data science machine learning applications. So probably the the most uh, interesting or the, the the most obvious application is in uh, in in neural networks, um, in particular in classifiers. So then what happens is that our p, uh, which is you know which is the reality, uh, encodes. Uh, encodes the, the correct label uh, as a probability vector. So this is this what they call one hot encoded vector. And then Q corresponds to, to the prediction given by a single prediction for a single example output by a network. And then uh, the loss is computed as, as the KL divergence and then summed up over all, uh, over all examples. And um, and KL, I mean, one thing which we're not really going into here is KL is, is a nice function to, to minimize. It has not nice properties. It does not lead to, to convex minimization in, in this case, um, but, um, but it, is, uh, it is a very standard loss to, to minimize. Also in, in popular tools like TSNI and, and UMAP, uh, also KL is minimized in, for example, in reinforce, reinforcement learning, this is also uh, used so uh, so hopefully if you if you have never seen this hopefully this is this helps kind of understand what what is happening inside those uh, those tools uh, I should mention that in 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 this context we can always we can often use uh, KL and cross entropy kind of interchangeably uh, in particular if if we're trying to to tune to learn Q or we're tuning Qs, but P is fixed, just like in this case, because P is the, the correct label, then minimizing KL just reduces to min minimizing cross entropy um, because we have those two, uh, we have those two elements and, and one of them is, is fixed. Uh, so so often, uh, often in neural networks, uh, we're talking about the cross entropy loss, but minimizing KL in this case, so we, we could be as well talking about the KL loss uh, wouldn't make a difference. Okay, so with this, uh, let's let's go back to to some topological ideas. Uh, so let's say we want to use the schoolback library divergence in conjunction with with our uh, Vietoris ribs construction. Uh, and the, the the problem I hinted at is that KL is non-symmetric. So it's not even clear how, how one would compute the, the one skeleton of, of, the, of the VR complex. Um, I mean, it's, it's not clear how, how one would compute the, um, the weights of the, of the edges just because of the asymmetry. And of course, you could try to, to symmetrize, maybe take the maximum, but it does not lead to, lead to anything which, is, which would be uh, interpretable. Uh, so one idea uh, is to, uh, instead of computing what what things normally would be to compute the one skeleton of the check complex uh, or the check filtration, and so so to do this we 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 have to start talking about balls in particular KL balls and and their intersections. Uh, so let's let's talk about this. Uh, so we. We don't really want to compute the full check complex. We just want to compute the one skeleton, which will be the basis for our uh, for our VR filtration. Uh, so, like I said, uh, let's let's talk about KL balls. Because of the asymmetry, we can define two types of balls, and let's focus on uh, what we what we call primal balls. Uh, so, a primal ball with center C and some radius, which would be expressed in bits. Uh, are just all the points in our domain, all the points in our standard uh, simplex, such that the callback library divergions are computed from C to this any to any point X is smaller than R bits. 
Uh, so th those balls would look kind of like this. And they look differently depending on where you put them. Uh, and one way of thinking about those balls is that then co they contain all probab probability vectors, which can be used to approximate the center uh, with the loss of at most r bits. And maybe let, let's not look at the formulas for now, but but the idea is quite simple. Just like in the check complex, what we do, we, we have our two points, P and Q, and we, we grow balls around them at, uh, at the same pace. And there is, at some point, they will intersect, and there will be, uh, for KL balls, there is actually a unique point uh, of of this first intersection, and this is the this is kind of a special point we will use uh, to to define um, some kind of distance. And another way of of thinking about this special point, which I call the intersection point for simplicity, uh, is that it uh, it minimizes uh, this formula uh, involving uh, those two. Uh, KL divergence computations. So we compute them from, so we, we try to minimize all our points. And what we are minimizing is KL computing from P to this point X, then from Q to this point X, and we take the maximum. So one way of thinking about this is that we kind of try to compute something which could be roughly described as a, I don't know, worst case joint approximator for both for P and Q. So we, this is kind of a point which is equally good at approximating P uh, and Q in this kind of... Hubert? Yeah? Uh, there's a question in the chatting by Thomas. Oh, okay. Why not use the Zenzen shannon divergence here to ad hoc? Uh, th this is a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will literally have just and Shannon in in the next slide on or, or the next so so yes yeah, so this is this is a very good question uh it's uh, and and the the answer to this is actually kind of the you know the crux of this talk so uh so we have this intersection point and we also have the intersection uh radius which is simply you know the radius at which uh this first intersection occurred uh which is literally the the KL divergence from p to the intersection point which is the same as the KL from Q to I. Uh, and with this, we could already define a, a kind of satisfying viatoris ribs filtration. Uh, so let's say, just to be consistent with what happens in the, uh, in the metric case, uh, we, we compute the edge weights just as, let's say, twice this intersection radius. Uh, and then we once we have the one skeleton, uh, we just extend this information to higher dimensions as, as usual. So nothing, nothing new here. We just take, if we have a higher dimensional simplex, we, we just compute the, the maximum of, of pairwise, um, of pairwise distances uh, in for each of the edges. So the only new thing is, is how we compute the, the edges, which is, uh, which is the nice thing about the Vietoris ribs construction. Rips construction. Uh, one issue is that computing this intersection radius is is not entirely trivial. Uh, so we will want to find an approximation for this. Uh, it, it's not a terrible computation; it just boils down to a, to a pretty simple uh, convex optimizations. But since we have to do this uh, many times, I mean, often quadratically many times in the number of input points. Uh, this would slow things down, and and also this is not a kind of standard computation that you would just I don't know get in in standard libraries. Uh, so we we want to get something which is which is you know as intuitive, uh, hopefully, but but just slightly easier to compute. Um, so we want to find an approximation for this R K L. Uh, and there is another special point which is closely related to to the question. Uh, and this is just the the midpoint, literally the you know the the midpoint between the two distributions. 
So I mean, I, I just add up, add them up component wise and divide by two. So, so nothing really happening here. And there is this quite remarkable result, which is actually much, much more general than what I'm showing you here by Banerjee. Uh, and it tells that this midpoint uh, actually uh, minimizes uh, this expression here, namely, uh, we're minimizing overall points here with domain again, and it minimizes the mean. Uh, it minimizes the mean KL divergence computed from each of the points, from both of the points, uh, to to the special point. Um, and and it turns out that if you want to minimize this, the 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 mean is is what is the minimizer. Um, so, so just as a side note, I mean, this is this result actually shows that you can. This result is more general. This generalizes to, to arbitrary number of of points, and it actually shows that you can do things like uh, k-means clustering with KL, and actually also with arbitrary breakman divergences, which is which is quite remarkable. And this special point is the same for for all breakman divergences, which which is uh, which is actually uh, quite surprising. Uh, so now the idea is that we can, with this, we can talk about the Jensen-Shannon divergence, uh, which simply computes KL from, it's the average of the KL computed from our point P to, to the mean of the two points and KL computed from Q uh, to the mean. So M is simply the, our, our special point, which is just the, the mean of the two distributions. So, so Jensen-Shannon divergence has this very simple formula, uh, which is just the mean of two KL computations. Uh, I, I should stress this is not uh, this is not just the the mean of KL from P to Q and Q to P. This would be something very different. Uh, we are introducing this this extra special point. Uh, to which we we compute our divergence, and and now the question is how how the two compare. I mean, ultimately we would like to use the uh, the KL intersection radius because we have this nice uh, we have this nice interpretation for it. Um, but um, on the other hand, we have this easy to compute thing, which is the Jensen Shannon divergence and they minimize kind of similarly looking things, but uh, but but the expressions are quite different, and also the points can be completely different. So I mean, the the midpoint is is just fixed between the two points. Uh, the intersection radius uh, can actually be so. So one perhaps surprising thing is that the intersection radius actually has to be on the on the segment uh, between the two points, but it can be pretty much anywhere depending on the position of the points. Uh, so we have two completely different things. I mean, related, but but still uh, very different. In particular, they depend on points which which are completely uh, completely different. And something which 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 I think is very surprising is is this result we we have with with Herbert Edelsbrunner and and Giga uh, Virk, who hopefully is still here. Uh, and it just shows a, a very tight sandwiching between uh, the intersection radius, the KL intersection radius, and the Jensen-Shannon divergence. Uh, so, so the only thing here separating the two is this constant C, uh, which is, as you can see, this is very, uh, this is very small. Uh, so I, I would say that this is so, you know, the, um, this is so tight that we can pretty much in, at least in practical situations, we can uh, we can replace the computation of of the intersection radius with the computation of the Jensen-Shannon divergence, just like uh, you know, like 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 in the question which was asked, um, the and 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 we kind of get uh, you know we get very simple computations, but we also get this very nice interpretation uh, of the of the intersection radius. Um, so, so just to be explicit, uh, how can we now compute this 
approximation of of KL Vietor's rips filtrations. Again, uh, we just we just compute the let's say twice the Jensen Shannon um, as our as our pairwise distance. Jensen Shannon is obviously symmetric, uh, so so there's no problem there. And then, as usual, we we just extend it to higher dimensional uh, simplices. And the good thing is that, as you as you probably saw, Jensen Shannon is is trivial to compute. It can actually be computed even more simply than than by computing those two KL uh, divergences. So it's even easier. Uh, and this is a very standard computation. Uh, you you know if you if you play with Python, you can just use a SciPy implementation of this, which for, for which actually computes the, the square root of the Jensen Shannon, which also makes sense because Jensen Shannon is the square root of Jensen Shannon is actually uh, a proper metric. Okay, so to to summarize, uh, the the main point is that if you use Vettori's rips filtrations, uh, then they tend to play you know with some tuning. As you saw, they play quite nice with. Uh, with information theoretical distances, uh, so so this is nice, and uh, I hope that I managed to convince you that this kullback library divergence uh, is you know is is not only powerful because of you know the amount of the number of applications it has, but also quite intuitive uh, if you have never seen it before, and and then perhaps the main point is that we can kind of get a lot of this power we can get with with very simple computations in the context of 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 TDA by just switching to to the Jensen Shannon divergence which is very easy to compute and is a very good uh, approximation so uh, so I, I guess my hope is that the, the point of the stock was that if, if people work with uh, with data which which is like in our setup namely uh, probability vectors and then they they work with Vitoris rips filtrations which are currently probably the, the fastest thing you can you can compute uh, thanks to to tools like Ripser uh, then then hopefully you will you will remember that that there are those very easy to use tools which which you can just plug into it and uh, and and hopefully you will get more kind of reasonable results uh, out of out of your analysis um, yeah I think this is it thanks for listening Thank you, and let's unmute ourselves and thank you to today's speaker. Yeah, thanks for that. That was great. Okay, any questions? Yep, go on. Hey, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I also. Yeah, uh, I had a question regarding the application, which, uh -huh. uh, so uh, what would the topological features using this filtration would like, how can we intuitively imagine it or how to give mm -hmm. like some physical significance to them? Okay, yeah, I mean, so so yeah, this is obviously a, a good question and this is something I I, I didn't talk to because like there are no easy answers to this. One, one application which which I I could mention, which which is I think, we, which answers this question quite well, is uh, is is the following. So, uh, we looked at um, we looked at uh, neural networks, and we wanted to compare kind of the behavior the behavior of networks and some of them were le, le, to, to 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 put it very quickly some of them were kind of hacked and some of them were were okay uh, but we didn't know which ones are which and we wanted to kind of compare how how the neurons uh, activate and then so this actually gives you a bunch of points on the standard simplex this is this gives you a bunch of um I mean, you can express uh, those neuron activations as um, as probability vectors, and then if you uh, if you if you compute the the Vitoris rips complex, uh, you, in particular using the tools I mentioned here, uh, you would get two different persistence diagrams, and and by comparing the persistence diagrams, uh, you you would see 
uh, you would see actually a difference. And then you can uh, and then you can construct a classifier uh, which uses those topological features to distinguish between the two types of networks. So, so in short, this is one example which in, in which those type of methods work. Additionally, we, we uh, yeah, a, a good question is, is then what exactly those topological features uh, correspond to correspond to. And in this work, uh, we were actually able to uh, to to interpret um, in particular the most persistent cycles, the most persistent one-dimensional cycles which which occur in in those networks. And, and one interpretation of, of this is that uh, in this neuronal activation space, there is some kind of uh, some kind of shortcut uh, happens uh, in those in those hacked in those modified networks, uh, which uh, so, so this was just a very quick overview uh, just to just to make sure that those things are useful. Uh, I like I said, I have. I have another talk in this network in which I went into more details uh, about this application. So if you're if you're curious about this, I would I would actually look the other talk which in, in which I, I talk in in some detail about this uh, application. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for the explanation. I'll, I'm more curious now and look at the other talk. I mean, and obviously there are you know many many more uh, many more applications of TDL of TDA. Uh, which are which which are similar, uh, but uh, but this uh, but this one actually is is quite close to 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 what I described here. Okay, thank you. I think the next is A one. Hi, Hi Um hey. I, I, I was really, I mean, this is perhaps a little bit naive question. Uh -huh. um, you started by modeling everything within the simplex. Uh -huh. What is the underlying assumption? Because, you know, why are you like, I guess, I guess maybe you can explain to me why you're modeling everything under standard simplex and bring uh -huh. it to our dimensions. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I mean, oh, okay. So, so my point is that the data I'm kind of assuming that the data is are are let's say discrete probability distributions. Mm -hmm. So the data is naturally when I say the data lives in the standard simplex, I I, I just mean I, I just mean that all the co coordinates sum up to one and and that there are no negative. Mm, I see. So this is this is this is just a statement about kind of like how. How the the input data is is embedded. Mm -hmm. So does so. My follow up question is: In mm -hmm. this case, does your theory generalize if I don't force it to be probability measures, but some any other measures? Is this is is this how strong is this assumption in your mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I mean, yeah. so here I, I I'm specifically talking about the setup in which I want to use the the callback. Leibler divergence. So all this this interpretation on which I focus this really this is really about probability distributions, uh, which which I think is like a which I think is kind of the most obviously applicable setup. But like I said, so I mean, so one kind of natural. Uh, generalization of this is to this notion of Bregman divergences. So this KL is just one of many, one of you know uncountably, <laughs> infinitely many uh, divergences which behave in a very similar way. Uh, so in particular, uh, they they're not necessarily uh, limited to the standard simplex uh, because they are not necessarily uh, you know, in the in the setup of of discrete uh, probability distributions. So, so so this is what I talked about, and and you know this restriction. It's it's just because I really want to focus on on this particular setup uh, with this particular Bregman divergence, uh, which is the Kullback library divergence. Uh, but the many of the results we have are much more 
general and in particular you can you can you can do pretty much the same trick except for the Jensen Shannon part uh, with with any Bregman diversions. Uh, you can also compute uh, you know check complexes uh, and uh, alpha complexes and and wrap complexes and and whatnot. Uh, also also the the witness complexes. So all of the standard tools kind of apply uh, in this much broader setup of Bregman divergences. Uh, what I showed about is like the most immediately applicable and also the by far the easiest tool to compute. So this is like I, I think what what can be really used without any problems uh, at all if you you know if you just use Ripser and you use an implementation of this Jensen Shannon like there is nothing else to to do like there no, there is no extra code to write on anything like this. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And I think there was one more question, uh, Bill. Yeah, um, and and it's entirely possible that this is the exact question that was just asked, uh -huh. um, but I'm maybe a little a little too ignorant to know uh, if I, if there's a distinction. Um, so. Okay, so you, you it's it's flirting around the same area though. Um, so, all right. Uh, so you said this is you know you're looking at the special case where maybe the the point cloud that you want to compute the Vitoris rips complex lives inside of the standard simplex. Um, and I guess what I'm curious about is, let's say I've got a point cloud of data that doesn't. Mm -hmm. um live inside the standard simplex um is the right move to jump to the i think you said it was the bregman complex or or something uh okay or is there a normalization step to translate my point cloud into a probability space and then uh -huh. use kl to get uh -huh. a similar barcode a similar filtration uh but but with the with the kl divergence so i yeah, is there like a, a, a translational tool or or uh mm -hmm. if my point cloud is euclidean data then i'm stuck in euclidean space and if it's probabilistic data then i'm stuck in probability uh -huh. space or, or mm -hmm. I just okay in I, general i see the, i see, I see. okay here? uh right so yeah this is a good question uh so 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 the first thing i would say is that is that de definitely what kind of distance you know distance measurement you want to use this this definitely depends on what what your data you know how how you're interpreting your your data so if you're you know if your data are just points in in r3 which are i don't know uh scans of of some object or something like this then i mean then most probably what what really matters for you are are, are the euclidean distances between them Right. I mean, so, and then forcing them to to be on the simplex. I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, this is not something you, you you could do this. But then the question is, if this is the the kind of right modeling step that you want to do. I mean, I, I'm just showing like a case in which definitely you you, yeah, you would yeah. like to do this. Uh, so so I, my point is that it really I think depends on the data. Uh, this example I mentioned with uh, how how this is done in neural networks in particular in classifiers is i think interesting because what is often used is that the output of the pan ultimate layer of the network is actually not a discrete probability distribution and then you technically you could just use you know some other distance maybe you would you would treat it as uh, as points in euclidean space but then the next setup forces the points to be on the standard simplex. So what they apply is something called the, the softmax activation function, which literally just uh, pushes everything onto the standard simplex, uh, and then they apply, mm -hmm. and you know, and then they're in the in the situation in which they can talk about KL and cross entropy. And this is this is quite a common trick uh, in, in in machine learning. Uh, so so so. If you, 
so, so I think in many situations, it actually makes sense to kind of force your data to be expressed with as, as probability distributions, even if like a priori nothing really suggests that that they are probability distributions, we, which is, I mean, it, it clearly works really well in, in various machine learning algorithms. Uh, in, in what kind of situations you, 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 can, you can actually do this and it makes sense, I think it, uh, it, it's very hard to tell. Um, so I, I don't so, really have a so... good answer to this, uh, but, but I, I think those are mm -hmm. some of the things to, to maybe consider uh, in, in, in kind of making so... those kind of, yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to say, so not, not, not to say that one should, but one, I guess, could in theory learn an embedding of the data with like node devec or word devec or something like this, where the last step of the embedding is a softmax something or other and compute the KL Vitoris rips filtration using the JS divergence <laughs> as an approximation. Mm -hmm. And see something, and whether or not that's useful, I have no idea because I just learned a lot of these words uh, mm -hmm. within the last hour or so. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in theory, that that flow would make sense. <laughs> yes, yes, I think this would definitely make sense. I mean, and so, 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 a simple case in which it definitely makes sense is that let's say you already have output, let's say of this of this classifier, which which use internally uses let's say cross entropy, ju just as many of them do. And then let's say, mm -hmm. so it was trained using cross entropy, and then I, I had my data points are, you know, let, let's say I want to compute the VR filtration out of the points, uh, which are the predictions, then I, I would say definitely makes sense to, uh, to, to use the, um. the framework I, 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 I described. So then you would, uh, you, you would use KL. So this would be like this, the simplest yeah, case. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, why, why would okay. a Euclidean distance matter if an entropy loss function is your loss function and vice yeah. versa? Yeah, that, that yeah. perfectly makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, so this is kind of the, the simplest case in which I think looking for an alternative would actually be, uh, you know, would really have to be, you know, explained, and this would be my default choice in, in this particular case. Uh, and so, so, so one last comment about what you said is that, so, so again, like this KL divergence is is just one, uh, one of many Bregman divergences, um, and in in many applications, it it would actually make sense to to use another Bregman divergence. Uh, so one example would be something called the Itakura Saito divergence. Uh, which which was designed to work with, uh, with 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 audio samples, short audio samples represented as uh, by some uh, spectral features uh, of those sounds. So I mean, and and then it relies on a, on a kind of different entropy called the Burke entropy. So so in this case, applying K wouldn't make sense because this is not kind of the uh, you know, it's based on on a different entropy, which which is tuned for a different type of uh, of a situation. So, so this is kind of another aspect of this that uh, I, I think the point is that you should know something about your data and how you know how if there is a standard distance which is used for for this type of data, then I would most probably try to use this first. Um, but if you if you have discrete probability distributions. Uh, KL is is likely a, you know a good default choice. Okay, I saw one last question. Uh, hi, uh, my camera is failing on me again. Very nice okay. talk. Thank you so much. Um, I I don't live in the probabilistic world that much, uh, but I've been trying to sort of imagine uh, the geometric topological situation that you're creating um, and I'm not smart enough to do it. So uh, my question basically is, but uh, there is a, 
there is a, a way to think of uh, pro, uh, frequencies uh, when we talk about probabilities, you know, leave aside uh, epistemic questions there. Uh, have you thought about that connection? And is that a fruitful way to get to a reading of what homology means in this picture? Or is that a, a, a false path that I'm imagining in my head? Uh, so, so actually, I... I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're imagining, actually. So, so, oh, so I you, see. You yeah, well, yeah. So is you have you have random events, and they occur mm -hmm. with a certain frequency, mm -hmm. and the frequency do you then just literally interpret as you know something in say a spectrum, right? And then that is just a cycle, right? You can associate that with a cycle, and you get to a geometric picture by reading it that way, right? So, say you have a discrete spectrum, each each peak in your speed spectrum would be one loop. And so uh, that will tell you, say, so if your first homology is three, you know, maybe these are these three loops from your uh, frequency in your probabilistic event. I don't know if that's enough information to, uh, to get to understand why, why I'm asking this. Clearly, so I'm sorry, very articulate question. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I, yeah, so I mean, I I don't think I can really answer answer this. Like, I, I, what I can say is that is this definitely now not how I would how, how I'm thinking about this. So so maybe you maybe you know something more, uh, and, and maybe may you know maybe in the end the, the the two ways of thinking about this coincide. But this is definitely not how I how I think about the the cycles which which happen. Okay, interesting. Is there is there some in, in one of your papers? Do you give some guidance on how one can learn to think about this more topologically and what we think of homology in this setting? Mm. I, I I would like honestly, I would say not not really. Like okay. I I think we we mostly focus on. On, on on how to you know on the fact that you can actually use those topological tools in in those setups because mm -hmm. this is this is kind of not uh not obvious uh that I, that, that it actually works and and not not so we we don't say so much about about possible interpretations so i think I, this is kind I, of i think that's mm -hmm. very fine in the machine learning context because you know if you are in the machine learning algorithm that algorithm just sees like uh, a betty number and data that, that algorithm doesn't need to interpret that in a in a mental image of the geometry that like we might like right so that's i think mm. that's totally fine i just like to do this thing so it's it's sort mm. of a you can read it as a deficiency of me and not not of your work it's very nice work thank you so much mm -hmm. i mean thank you yeah i mean obviously if if we you know if we could ideally we would really be able to 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 interpret uh, kind of to to give like a general way of interpreting the the topological information we get, but but at this point I don't think we can, and I I'm actually not sure if 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 there are like kind of global interpretations if, if this is even possible. Like I I think maybe all we can hope for is like uh, you know application specific um, interpretations and, and and one of them we actually we have in this in this applied work I, I mentioned with with Chao Chen and, and Songju Zhang. Uh, other than this, yeah, I, I would like to, to to know more about about interpretations, but at this point we, we're just happy we can compute something. All right. Very nice work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let me stop the recording.